ES Audio. From the Evening Standard in London, I'm John Weeks, and this is The Leader. On July 5th, the new National Health Service starts. Have you chosen your family doctor? Today marks 75 years of our National Health Service, a pillar of modern British society that's lived through huge changes in technology, culture and politics. This new health service will be organised on a national scale as a public responsibility. Healthcare that's free at the point of use may seem like a fairly obvious, beneficial and even necessary service. But the NHS was the first health service in the Western world to offer free medical care to the entire population. Just over the ponds, Americans still rely on health insurance or simply pay huge bills to access the care they need. And most countries across Europe have a combination of both private and public health care. However, on its 75th birthday, the UK's NHS is struggling. Having battled through a global pandemic, it's now having to deal with record-long operation waiting lists, hospital waiting times, and frustrations among doctors and nurses over pay and staffing. Our health service is very much in a crisis. So, how do we mark this 75th birthday? And where is our beloved NHS heading next? Joining me now is our health reporter, Daniel Keane. So Dan, 75 years ago today, the UK government decided to create a national health service. What prompted it and what were the sort of founding concepts and ideas around it? So yeah, it's an extraordinary day, 75 years of the NHS. And it was very much the creation of one man, Anurin Ni Bevan, who was pretty much single-handedly responsible for the idea of the NHS, which has gone on to become a model, really, for sort of socialised healthcare across the world. Uh, And today, I'd say it's definitely Labour's greatest achievement in office. So what you had in the UK prior to the NHS was a sort of patchwork of of healthcare, uh, almost like a two-tier system. There was no free healthcare. The only free healthcare that was available was provided by voluntary organisations and charities who owned most of the hospitals. So essentially, if you were poor, it was very difficult to get any kind of treatment. People were also accessing healthcare through insurance schemes. So, you know, a large portion of the population was being left in debt if, if they chose to, to access healthcare that way. But when Labour took power in the aftermath of the Second World War, the NHS became part of a sort of sweeping reform of society, really, along with welfare schemes. And Bevan was tasked with bringing all of these sort of disparate parts of the health service under one roof. And it would be funded by taxation, which was radical at the time. So tr- all treatment would be provided at the, free at the point of use. And 75 years later, that extraordinarily is, is still the case. Skip forward to today, and there are new stories stats, data figures almost every day about the struggles facing the NHS, waiting lists for operations, waiting times to see GPs, and of course, various strikes, certainly more recently. How would you summarise the NHS today compared with where it was at its peak? Well, I think it's important to say that there are regularly headlines about the NHS in crisis. It seems as if every winter we have headlines saying that the NHS is on its knees, uh, that this is its worst ever crisis. I mean, this has been going on since since the 80s or 90s. And some of our older listeners will, will recognize that language. But the scale of the task of rebuilding the NHS now is huge. And the performance statistics that we're seeing, particularly in the last eight or nine months, are the worst on record. And if you speak to people that have worked in the NHS since the 1970s and 80s, they will tell you they've never quite seen the level of pressure that, that staff are currently under. So you have the attritional effect of, of, of being, you know, under significant pressure since the pandemic, but also staffing is just an area of serious concern. There are shortages of doctors, there are shortages of nurses, just about every profession in the NHS is, is short. And I suppose even if you compare that to a relatively recent period, like the mid noughties during the new Labour government, public satisfaction was quite high with, with, with the NHS and, and throughout the 90s as well. But it has been steadily falling since about 2018. But I think I would draw a very sharp distinction between the sort of pre-pandemic NHS and the post-pandemic NHS and all of the problems that, that existed 
you know, like staff retention, burnout, um, sort of issues, you know, delays to, to cancer diagnosis have just been really sort of harshly exacerbated by the pandemic and are all kind of coming to a head now this year. Particularly last winter, I think many staff will tell you was just by far the worst they've ever experienced. We're coming up to what could be quite a big turning point now for the NHS in terms of the next general election. Do we have any clues as to how the NHS might change any potential policies if the government does change, but also if the Conservatives do remain in power? Sure. So the, the major change that, that we've seen in the past couple of weeks has been the NHS workforce plan, which was published on Thursday. And I think that if that does, you know, the, the, an extra 300,000 nurses, doctors and other health workers, if, if that is implemented by whether it's this government or Labour or whoever comes into power, that that will see a significant change and an improvement to, to NHS services. So that will be the main, you know, pillar of of. The, the government's argument, the Conservatives' argument is we're going to fix staffing in the NHS. It might take 15 years, but these are our goals. I think most people working in the NHS would tell you that staffing is the single biggest issue that needs to be fixed. So I think that's one thing. Labour have quite an ambitious plan for fixing areas like health inequalities. So why there is such a gap between the care that is received by white and black people in the UK bringing down rates of smoking and obesity in some of the most deprived areas. Uh, we don't yet know what, what the plan is for Conservatives is on, on that front, but it's something that Labour are really keen to push. And then uh, another policy, of course, is you know to trying to improve diagnostics and operations by taking them out of hospital settings. And that's something that Conservatives are really keen on, is having diagnostic hubs where people can actually, that aren't hospitals, where people can go and um, get an MRI scan or something like that. And I think all of it is about bringing treatment closer to patients. So there are a lot of ideas floating around uh, and, and that are being trialed to improve the NHS. But, you know, I'd bring it back to that, to that question of staffing. And um, you know, as we can see, the strikes that, that we're seeing by junior doctors and, you know, consultants coming up, are unfortunately a symbol of a very, very demoralized and alienated workforce. Um, and until that issue is resolved, I can't really see any solution to, to the NHS crisis. You mentioned the staff there and how they do feel demoralized and uh, things are difficult at the moment for them. But how do you think NHS staff will be marking this 75th anniversary? Will it sort of be through gritted teeth or will it still be with a sort of pride in the work they do similar to what we saw over the pandemic? I think there'll be a really mixed picture and I think that everybody who works in the NHS is proud to work in the NHS. It is one of the most if not the most beloved institutions that, that this country has and I think that they you know work in the NHS for powered by kind of moral and ethical reasons rather than money. If, if people wanted to work for money, then they, they'd work for, for private healthcare companies. So I think that people in the NHS, their goodwill has run out. They feel that the, the conditions they're working in are, are simply too grave to carry on. So there will be immense pride, of course, at this you know national institution surviving as long as it has, but also a bit of an asterisk over... Um, over this anniversary, you know, we've got a strike by junior doctors literally a week after this this anniversary is the, the, the longest strike, I should add, in NHS history, just a week after this anniversary. So it is a bit of a stain on this. And um, I, I do think many people will have mixed feelings. Let's take a break now. In part two, East London A&D doctor Andrew Myerson talks about his fears for the NHS's future. There is deep, deep discontent right now in the NHS, and the government is not doing enough to listen. Joining me now is Dr. Andrew Myerson, who works in A&D at a hospital in East London. So, Andrew, here we are on the 75th anniversary of the NHS. How are you feeling on this anniversary as someone who works in the health service? Well, I have enormous pride and love for my job, enormous pride and love for the NHS. 
I come from the United States, the land of private health care, the land of having to show your credit card before you get treatment, the land of 30 million people who have no health insurance at all, and seeing so many Americans, family members and friends who um, have had their financial lives just ruined because of American health care. In the wealthiest country in the world, it's, it's barbaric. And so growing up with that and seeing what that's like, I come from a healthcare family and knowing what damage American healthcare does to patients, it's heartbreaking. And so when I came to the UK about eight years ago to study medicine here, I fell in love with this system. I, I feel like I, I arrived at the promised land of healthcare. You know, a lot of people talk about the, the, the model of the NHS as, you know, as somehow flawed. That's a myth. That is absolutely a myth. 10 years ago, you guys had the number one healthcare system on the planet. It was the best globally ranked the best. You know, your, when your government delivers healthcare, you want it to be in the best, the highest quality healthcare in the most cost effective way. And so it's an incredibly efficient system. But, you know, after 10 years of conservative governments running down the system, they've pulled massive amounts of funding out of it. We're talking about, you know, 40 billion pounds every single year over the last decade. They have eliminated countless hospital beds, A&E departments, and, and patients see it. Patients see what the experience is now. You know, 10 years ago, any patient could see their GP within 24 to 48 hours. You could be seen in A&E in under four hours. And, you know, now we have, you know, the longest waiting list in NHS history. It's 7.4 million people long. And in the sixth wealthiest country on the planet, I think that's it's it's a catastrophic failure of government. And obviously that transformation in the last 10 years has been, relatively speaking, a downfall with various things not going well. What do you think needs to be fixed to get the NHS back up to that high of, as you say, the best in the world? There are four major issues within the NHS. One is funding. Um, one is staff. One is beds and one is social care. And all of those, you know, those four things are really, really important problems that we need to tackle that the government needs to take seriously. You know, the government talks about record funding increases. It's all, you know, empty words. They will pull out 400 billion pounds out of, you know, NHS investment over the last decade and then throw a couple billion here and, you know, and try to pass that off as, you know, as massive funding increases. No, we're, we're dealing with a massive hole. NHS hospitals are falling apart. We have, you know, a huge backlog of repairs that need to be done to, you know, the physical buildings. The second massive, massive concern with the NHS is staff. If we don't have enough staff, if we don't have doctors and nurses, every single bit of the patient experience from seeing their GP to going to A&E to get cancer care to getting off that longest waiting list in NHS history, all of that is going to require nurses, doctors, you know, uh, other essential, critically important NHS staff um, from, you know, from, from the clinicians to administrators. This, this is a, an enormous problem. And if the government's making it too difficult to work in the NHS right now, and we're seeing you know, NHS staff leave in droves because it's just, the, the pay and conditions are just that poor, then, you know, patients are suffering because of that. There is deep, deep discontent right now in the NHS and the government is not doing enough to listen. And I understand you're concerned about the NHS heading closer and closer to privatisation. What signs and changes have you noticed to lead you to believe that? Well, I mean, it's just it's if you look at the data, we're talking about, you know, there's there are estimates of up to 20 percent of NHS services are, you know, have now been privatized. And that means that means contracts with private providers. So the patient will be sent to a private provider in order to to get that care. And the problem with that is that massive sums of money end up going to these companies for them to pull out, you know, a certain amount of that money, you know, in profit. And so a lot of money that would have been reinvested back into the system, you know, is just taken as profit, skimmed off the top by these private companies. And the public understands what this is like. They see what the, you know, the water companies, for example, this government allowed our water, our water to be privatized. And we see the consequences of that with, you know, Thames Water and a number of different um, uh, other companies. And also with the, the trains, the experiment with privatization has absolutely failed. And for this government to to then claim on the back of the, these these privatization failures that you know continued involvement of the private sector in the NHS that that's somehow positive no it's the same concept it's the same model it's the same stealing from the public all of the money all of the investment that should have gone back into taking care of them you know it being stolen by by private companies and people that don't even live in this country that don't care about it don't use the NHS it's a deeply parasitic relationship that that needs to end because it does not help patients in in, in the slightest pick up the evening standard newspaper for more news interviews and analysis or head to standard.co.uk that's the leader thanks for listening we're back tomorrow afternoon at four o'clock